grow and succeed, I think you have to have some level of ego. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and today I'm joined by Mr. Ryan Hoover. If you're new to the show, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for all of our other episodes. They're all available for free. We have video, we have photos, we have links, all kinds of great stuff to help you understand more about our guests or the topics that we cover on our Thursday episodes. And of course, if you want to suggest a person or a subject that we can tackle on this show, go ahead, fill out the form there, and we'll see what we can do. Honestly, at this point, the majority of our guests come from listener suggestions, and we prefer to do it that way. That way we know we're bringing the individuals to you that you want to hear from. Plus, let's be honest, it makes our job easier. And of course, if you want to check out the other stuff that we do here at Whistlekick, the best place to start is, you might have guessed, whistlekick.com. From our products to our other projects, so much stuff out there that we're doing for you, the traditional martial artist. Head on over. Let me know what you think. You can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com, and you can find us on social media at whistlekick. But let's talk about today's guest. Mr. Ryan Hoover is a sought after speaker and presenter and instructor of the martial arts, of combatives. He's a school owner and he has a deep traditional background. But like a number of the folks that we've had on the show and some of you out there, his roots and tradition led him to some other angles, some other avenues within the martial arts. Things that some might call more real or more street worthy. However you term it, this was a great conversation. And Mr. Hoover is a wonderful man and I really enjoyed speaking with him. I got a lot out of it. I'm sure you will too. So let me step back and welcome him to the show. Mr. Hoover, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thanks, Jeremy. Glad to be here. Great to have you here. I appreciate you coming on. You know, we, we may get into it later, but you were a suggestion from one of the rare multi-time guests on the show. So, of course, when, when someone that I know so well says, hey, here's a person you need to talk to, I say, hey, let's, let's get them on the show. I need to talk. Yeah. And you're well, one of those. Yeah, that's always good to hear. Well, you know, it, it's a martial arts show, and there's kind of one thing that we got to get out of the way before we start talking about anything else. And that's your martial arts background. So I always ask it in this, this kind of story opening way. How did you get started? Yeah. Um, you know, probably like most people, uh, it was an interest to me as a, as a kid. Um, I, I'm 44 years old. So I, I, I grew up about the time that Bruce Lee had passed, but the movies were, you know, pretty popular. Um, so I enjoyed watching those things, but never really had an opportunity as a kid to, to train. So I kind of came to this later in life. Um, I didn't really start getting too much involved, um, on a kind of formal level until I was in college and, um, did, I uh, got a black belt in uh, karate, got a couple of advanced black belts and Shorenji Kempo. Um, but at some point, you know, it was like, I mean, I'm a small guy. I've always been a small guy. Um, so growing up, I, I, I learned out really fast that I needed to, to figure out how to run, how to talk and how to fight. <laughs> and so, um, at some point, you know, I came to this realization that the things that I were, was doing in my training didn't really, parallel so well with the fights that I'd been in. So I, I started branching out and I trained in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I did some Balenta Walk Our Knee, still do both of those things to this day. Um, got pretty heavily involved in Muay Thai, went to Thailand, trained there, um, heavily involved in Krav Maga, uh, co -authored, authored three books uh, on, on that topic. Um, lots of wrestling. Um, I, 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 now at this point in my life, you know, I, I kind of dabble in as much as I can. I, I bring in a judo coach. I bring in a wrestling coach. Um, 
we earlier this year brought in um, and hired on my staff uh, a, thai, a Thai boxing instructor and uh, another jiu-jitsu black belt. And, um, so I'm always trying to see what else is out there and better myself and, and whatever. Um, so even though I got started later in life, I've still, you know, I've got about two decades of this as a major part of my life. You know, as, as you're talking about it, you're, you know, there, there's a, forgive me for kind of reading between the lines, but there's a, there's a seeming disconnect in the way you're talking about some of your, your earlier training or maybe the breadth of your training and kind of the emotion. When people talk about having, you know, earned a black belt or, and multiple black belts, there's, there's a, um, no, no, no matter how, how, um, balanced i think their ego is there's a sense of pride that comes through and you almost sound dismissive am i am i hearing that um it's possible it, okay. it, it's it's unintentional um but it, it it is possible i i guess over time and and traveling and training and, and teaching all over the planet you know I, i've met lots of people in my in my life that have no ranks or have um lower ranks and are incredible fighters, incredible martial artists, incredible instructors. Um, and then I've met, you know, the other end of the spectrum where, where guys have walls covered and wallpapered in uh, certificates and, and things like that. And on the, the physical level, on the transfer of knowledge level, or just not to me that impressive. So, um, those things for me were part of my journey, no doubt. And, and maybe I needed to go through that to get me where I am now. Um, but yeah, I don't like, if you, I own two training centers. Um, you're not going to see certificates hanging on my walls. I don't walk around with a black belt on. I don't walk around with, um, a shirt that says instructor or anything like that. Um, you know, I, even in, even in Krav Maga, I mean, I'm, I'm eight years removed from a second degree black belt in Krav Maga. And at that time, there were maybe, I don't know, 10 in the whole country at that level. Um, so it's just not something that I, you know, uh, I, I prefer for my, my abilities to transfer knowledge and my abilities to execute to, to speak uh, for me. Um, you know, I, and, and that's not to be dismissive of, of other people that put more credence or value in those things. I mean, I, I have no problems with people being proud of what they've done in their lineages and things like that. But to me, those are very personal things and things that, you know, outside of the individual don't really mean a whole lot. Mm. And I know that puts me in a, in a, 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 a very small category in the martial arts world. Well, it, you know, honestly, it may not be as small as you think. And just from my personal anecdote of observation, you know, the folks I'm exposed to because of this show, it seems to be a growing group. There seems to be the, this group of folks like yourself who, for whatever reason, started to value other aspects of the martial arts, other, found other ways to subjectively score we'll say right the effectiveness of someone as a martial artist as a martial arts instructor was there an epiphany was there a moment that led to you looking at things in this way or was it something more gradual um i think it was more gradual i i, I think it you know it just kind of happened over time um the more i was exposed to large organizations um, and the way that instructors were, were cultivated and, and pushed through systems and things like that. I think at some point, I, and, and, you know, honestly, maybe I became a little bit jaded. Um, but at some point I was, I, I kind of looked at the world around me and, and decided that I didn't really want to be contributing to the things that I was currently contributing to. Um, I, 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 I didn't want to engender this culture where this certificate was the thing um as opposed to 
the thing being the thing, you know, I, I, when I travel and do instructor courses or teach seminars or whatever, um, if I go to somebody's center, I try to watch their students and, and see how their students move and interact and, and, and perform. I don't really watch the instructors all that much. Um, I've met plenty of, you know, world-class athletes and, 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 and fighters that could not coach, could not teach. Um, and then I've met some that, you know, on the attribute side are, are maybe mediocre, but have an incredible ability to transfer knowledge. And to me, where I am and in, in, in my life and my journey, I, I put more value and, and more emphasis on that person, the person that is able to take someone, um, and, and get them to a level of proficiency. Um, as opposed to, you know, uh, an instructor that, that has incredible attributes. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And if you got both, that's fantastic. But um, my, my premium has been on in the past few years, especially on the, the ability to, to teach, the ability to coach, the ability to take somebody from, from zero to 100. Now, the first, time, first couple of times you used the, the notion of teaching you use the words transfer knowledge. Yeah. Is that, are, are those words chosen intentionally? I've never heard anyone express it in that way. So I'm guessing there's something to it. Sorry. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, in our industry, there's a lot of terms thrown around. Um, teacher, instructor, coach, Zipu, sensei, all, all, all of these things. And I think each one on, on its own carries certain connotations. Um, and, and for me, the title doesn't really mean that much. It, it's the, the person's ability to take information that, that they've learned over time and then be able to transfer, be able to give that to somebody else and then allow that somebody else to kind of make it their own. Um, our teaching kind of protocol here is we give students a, a skeleton a framework and then it's up to them to kind of fill in the muscle around it because I just don't believe in, in teaching everyone to, to fight the same way. People don't move the same way. People have different body types. People have different backgrounds. People have different experiences. Um, people are longer, taller, you know, bigger, smaller, older, younger, whatever. And for me to try to make a uh, 200, 40 pound, six foot four guy fight the same way that, you know, 115 pound, five, three woman fights just makes no sense. Um, so to be a, in, in my opinion, to be a really good instructor or coach or whatever, um, it, it's not about reading from a manual and going to your frequently asked questions section or your common problem section or whatever. It's your ability to take information that you've gathered over time and then transfer that in a way to people that is palatable for them. I like that. I, I enjoy the imagery of that. Long time listeners know that I've spent a fair amount of time teaching, sharing, transferring knowledge, whatever you choose to call it. And there's wow. so much more of a process in identifying how to share that knowledge with students, with, with students differently, right? I mean, you certainly know that if you've spent any time, anybody who's spent any time teaching knows that if you have 10 people and you're teaching them all the same way, you're probably doing it wrong. Yeah, but that's the easy way. You know, it's, it, it's, it's really easy for me to get up in front of a group of people um, and, and try to have them all conform to one way. As an instructor, that's easy, um, easier to do uh, because now I don't, I don't have to, think i don't have to be analytical i can you know just draw on whatever has been force fed to me through manuals or videos or or courses or whatever and then i can just parrot those things so i get why it's done um, because it is easier and on some level you know i think a lot of students want that i mean a lot of people just in in all walks of life just want somebody to tell them what to do you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, having to, to, to think about it critically. Um, so that's why I say, you know, we, we try to give that framework 
and let let students kind of paint that picture on their own or we, we give them the skeleton and let them fill in the muscle um because again it, it, people are different and I, I i try as best i can to cultivate instructors that are able to analyze and 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 transfer in a way that is not cookie cutter as you've spent your time traveling around imparting knowledge transferring knowledge there we go onto others and in your own training i'm sure you've picked up quite a few stories as you already know as the listeners know i love stories they're my favorite part about this show <laughs> so if i was to ask you what is your favorite martial arts story what would you tell us uh, man that's tough um Years ago, so, well, I, I, I'll, I'll say one thing. If, if anybody ever gets the chance to train with uh, Grandmaster Bobby Tabata in uh, Balenza Walker on East, the man is a terrific storyteller. Um, I, I would just sit there and listen to him tell stories all day uh, and, and, and forego the training if, <laughs> if I could. Um, the training is great, but storytelling is fantastic. Um, I don't know. That's a tough one. Um, Earlier in my, my, my career, I spent a lot of time with um, Boss Rutan. And um, if anybody knows much about Boss Rutan, he's quite a, a personality. He's quite a character. And uh, I, I probably had him here at my center, I don't know, six times, maybe something like that. And there are several stories that I could tell about Boz, but I'll, I'll tell a, a quick one because it also involved Randy Couture. Um, I had I hosted Boz and Randy here um, together the first time they had taught together, and we the the turnout was tremendous. I ended up renting a high school uh, gym for us to train in, um, and I'd never met Randy before this. I'd worked with Boz several times, and so I picked them both up from the airport and it was kind of late and we were training at uh in gastonia north carolina which is kind of a, a smaller town smaller city so there wasn't much open um so we stopped at uh i can't remember if it was a chili's or an applebee's uh but one of those because it was about the only thing that was still open late and randy was sitting directly beside me and boz was sitting directly across from me and randy was wearing you know just like some cargo shorts and a t-shirt and had a hat on was pulled down real low kind of over his eyes and he was sitting beside me and i could barely hear him talk he was just very quiet very reserved um and i had to really listen to him to to hear what he was saying and Boz sitting directly across from me was completely opposite he's big guy bald head he's wearing a boss rootin shirt he's getting up in the restaurant telling stories <laughs> really loud really demonstrative um virtually shadow boxing right there in the in the restaurant um and, and just the the dynamic between the two of those guys both you know former ufc world champs um both tremendous martial artists and, and fighters and just to see the the interaction between the two of them and how different they were was um pretty interesting um that same trip we boz had just done some kind of martial arts movie i can't remember what it was now um a straight to video kind of thing and so this was back when you know blockbuster and media play and places like that were still a thing and this movie had just been released, so Boz wanted us to take him to one of these places to see if they could see if they had it, because uh, he hadn't seen it in a store yet. And he was like a a a twelve year old waiting for Santa. You know, it was it was pretty it was pretty funny to watch uh, such a big, tough, strong, um, seasoned fighter be, get so excited about something like that. So that was a pretty cool trip and experience to just get to hang out and spend time with, with guys at that level um 
I don't know. There's so many, man. I've, I've, I've cornered UFC fights. I've, you know, trained in Thailand. That was pretty awesome. Um, that, that, that's an experience I'd love to do again. Um, I don't know. There's a lot. I, I I've taught oh, over Europe. I've, I've, there should be a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to choose. And as soon as we get off here, I'm going to think of 10 things, but, um, yeah, it, 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 it's a lot. Um, which, yeah, it's awesome. I mean, it's, I never would have imagined when I started doing this that, you know, I, I have clients that are NFL players. Well, here's a, I, I'll tell you another story real fast. Maybe seven or eight years ago, um, I got an email through my website, uh, from a mom looking for some training for her daughter who was going to be going off to UCLA. And, um, this was, this would have been like late spring. So we would have had maybe two or three months to train and I'd had a few sessions with them. They, they both worked, uh, out, they trained together, mom and, and daughter, and they were both athletic and, you know, um, uh, really into it and, and, and did really well. And one day, uh, mom says, do you mind if my husband, uh, comes and watches a session? And I'm like, no, that's true. That's fine. Well, I'm, I, I start teaching them and then he comes in and it turns out he's Ron Rivera, the head coach of the Carolina Panthers. And I'd been training these people for a month and had no clue. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we go through our session or whatever. And at the end of the session, he gets up and starts asking me a bunch of questions about some of the things I was saying, angles and, and, and push pull energy and making space and filling space and all this kind of stuff that, you know, it's, um, bread and butter stuff for us. And, um, we had a, we had a good talk and interesting dialogue and whatever. And then that led to, um, us training players at, at Panther stadium. Um, we, we started doing, uh, one day a week with the veterans and, and one day a week with the practice squad. And, you know, when I first started doing this, this was a part-time gig for me. You know, I worked a, a real eight to five job with insurance and 401k and vacation time and all the things you're supposed to have salary. And I was teaching at night as, as something to do because I hated my actual job. And, you know, when, when I started that, I never would imagine that would have led to, you know, working with an NFL team or we've done uh, NASCAR pit crews and, you know, all kinds of things. So it's, it's martial arts has really, you know, uh, provided a lot of pretty cool opportunities uh, for me. Now, what if, what if somebody's out there and they're, they're feeling like they want to kind of shift, you know, maybe, maybe they're in the hyper traditional space. Yeah. You know, that they're, they're going to karate, they're going to Taekwondo. And, and let me take a moment to step out to the side and say, this is not advocacy for one thing or the other. I think anybody who listens to the show knows my passion for the most traditional of traditional martial arts. So, okay, tangent over. Got it. But somebody, if somebody's listening and they're thinking, you know, I want to explore Muay Thai. I want to explore combatives. I want to explore some of these things that, you know, honestly, dovetail in. You can stack them on top, whatever visual you want to use. They, they relate, but they don't know where to start. And maybe they're nervous. Maybe, maybe they haven't gone through the mindset shift of letting go of the stripes on their belt or something like that. But they know that they want a little bit different or a little bit more. How might you suggest they make that first step? Yeah, it's tough because... Um... If, if you hit Google and just start throwing some things in there, it's really hard to figure out what is, is good training and what isn't um, because there is a lot of bad stuff out there, especially in what, what's often termed the reality-based self-defense world. Um, there's a lot of fear-mongering and false promises and things like that in that part of our industry. So it's not easy. And, and I get why it would be daunting to people. Um, it's one of the things we talk about a lot, um, in our instructor courses, um, because I, my, my personal opinion is most of the people that really need that sort of training 
will avoid it like the plague because of the way that it's often presented and marketed. Um, so my, my suggestion would be, um, and this is, you know, none of this is foolproof, but my suggestion would be, um, check out reviews, um, visit centers, um, centers to me, um, if, if your goal is to find a, a, a space that is conducive to learning and, and, and with an understanding that your goals are self-defense or fitness or whatever, um, they should have no problems with, you know, letting you watch classes. They should have no problems with you talking to other students and members, getting a feel for the place. Um, it's like anything else, you know, if, if I walk into a place and I immediately get this bad vibe or this unwelcoming vibe or this ego driven kind of uh, culture. Um, and that's probably not the place to, to go. Um, there are some great Thai boxing gyms out there. There are some great jujitsu gyms out there. There are some really good Krav Maga gyms out there, but man, it's not easy to find if it's all foreign to you. Um, so I, I, I would start by looking at reviews, narrow it down from there, visit the center, um, you know, and, 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 and look at it the way you would look at anything else. I mean, if you went into a, a doctor's office and things were in disarray and, you know, it was dirty and there's, there's nobody really paying attention to what's going on and it seems unsafe and these kinds of things, then walk. Um, if, if the equipment's not, you know, in, in, in good shape, it's all in disrepair. And it, it, if it doesn't seem that the, the instructors or the owners are taking care of their space, then the odds are they're probably not really going to take care of their students either. Um, so, and, and, and look, I've been in some, some great like basement garage type gyms too. Um, but I, I think those probably are more well suited to people that um, are, are not daunted by a first time experience. Um, so it, it, it's, it's not easy. There's, there's a lot of garbage out there. There is, you know, and, and I'm curious if you agree. I've always suggested that regardless of what style you're looking for, whatever your, your goal is, you know, the type of people you like to learn from. Yeah. You have an idea of the personality of the instructor. You have an idea of, you know, the general location you want to look in. And let's be honest, by the time you combine those two things, maybe with some restriction on the type of styles you want, you don't have a lot of choices. Right. So you're going in and you're visiting, you're chatting with the instructor, you're chatting with students, you're watching a class. And really, to me, it's a, it's a process of elimination. You're looking at the reality of it. What's the good? What's the bad? And you're looking for the things to say, you know, Am I going to spend a couple of years dealing with that? Right. And if it's something you can deal with, because no school is perfect. No, no. But if and it's something you can deal with, then that one stays on the list. And if it's not, you know, just like, uh, you know, a friendship or a romantic relationship, don't waste your time. Sure. Absolutely. Um, it's like anything, man. The, the, no restaurant's perfect, you know? I mean, you, you're going to have to, you're going to have to make some sacrifices to get what you want. Um, but you got to make sure that it's actually worth those sacrifices. And if I go into a place and I watch an instructor and I, just for me personally, and, and, and the way that I, I learn, and maybe this is, you know, 20 years removed or whatever, but I, I'm not, I'm not there to be treated like I'm in boot camp. I'm not there to be treated like I'm a child, you know, um, I, treat me like an adult. Uh, it, treat me like a, 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 a human. Um, I don't, I, I'm not into, you know, stroking the instructor's ego or anything like that. Um, you know, and that's just me personally. I, I, I have no problems respecting people that I work with and that I learn from. Um, again, Bobby Tabata is a great example of that. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I'm, I'm paying for a service. Um, and, and so I, I, I want that to be <laughs> reciprocated. You know, I, I, I want, it, it's a, 
yes, there there is an an instructor student relationship, but there's also a, a consumer provider relationship. Yeah, that relationship goes both ways. Yeah, the student has to receive value for the time and the and the resources, aka money, you know, that they're investing, and the instructor should feel like they're getting a good side of the deal too in that the the student is attentive and pays on time and and all that stuff i mean we could we could talk at length about that but it sounds like we're on the same page and i'm going to guess that 99 percent of the people listening would agree this is this isn't a subject that tends to get a lot of disagreement where the disagreement comes in is how that's implemented and of course that's so subjective sure when i talk to martial artists one of the things that they have consistently is the ability to overcome adversity whether it's the, the mental or the emotional components of training or the, the physical components of training, you know, we have a toolbox that most people don't have. Right. I'd love for you to tell us about a time where things weren't good and how your martial arts helped you move past it. Hmm. Um, 2000, well, 2003, I opened my first training center. I'd been teaching for a while before that, but 2003, I opened my first training center. Um, small city where I grew up. It did really well, was doing really well. Um, 2008, I opened my early 2008, I opened my second center in a much larger market and a much larger space. And then the bottom fell out of the economy. Um, and that because you know, in, in our industry, um, we're we're a luxury item. We're we're not something that people have to have. Uh, so if, if people start looking to to cut costs, we're going to be one of the first to feel that, one of the first to experience that. And so, two thousand eight came, and I had just opened up the second center. I had um, we had just had our second child. Um, that April and I was looking around like, I don't know that either one of these centers are going to make it now. You know, um, I had a super successful center and then I added one and, and adding that one, I, I was pretty sure we was going to bring down both of them. Um, because of the climate, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, uh, it would have been easy to hold up shop, go back to, an eight to five and, and have guaranteed salary and all that stuff. But that just wasn't my mindset. That wasn't my mentality. That wasn't, you know, the way that I had kind of uh, been conditioned over time. Um, my, my, my mindset was to dig in my heels and, you know, push harder. And so, went to the landlord and said, look, we're not going to make it. Um, if, uh, you give me a smaller space with less rent, I'll stay here and I'll make this work. And that was, that was late 2008. Um, three years after that, we doubled our space. Three years after that, we doubled our space again. Um, and we just signed uh, last month. I just signed a, a new five-year lease on um, an eighty-five hundred square foot space. So, you know, it, it, I think a lot of that probably has to do with the the the, the training. Um, a lot of that probably has to do with the way that I was brought up. But um, you know, training has definitely put some adversity on me, and. Um, forced me to fight through some things that, you know, maybe otherwise it would have been easy to just walk away from or quit on or give up or, or whatever. Um, Knowing what you know now, you know, if you went back, obviously you didn't know the bottom was going to fall out of the economy. Obviously you didn't know that those challenges were necessarily going to arrive. So let's go back to before those facts had occurred with what you know now, would you have done anything differently? Honestly, I I don't know that I would open a second center. <laughs> mm, oh, uh, okay, that's big. I, I um, 
just to give you a little bit more backstory, when I opened my first center, um, we sold our house. Um, we had our first child and we had our grand opening all within about three months of each other. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you know, and we, we sold our house so we could start this business. Um, so I, I have a bit of an intrepid kind of mindset and mentality, um, which probably drove me to open the second center. Uh, but in retrospect, you know, I don't, I don't know that I would do that again. Um, my experience is you don't just double the rent and double the utilities and, and all that stuff. You, you, you may be, triple or quadruple the headaches. So <laughs> yeah, that was my experience with opening a second location in my last business. Yeah. I, I, I just, um, a lot of good things have come from it. Um, for sure. Um, but I, I just don't know that I would do that again. Or if I did open a second one, I would maybe downsize the first or sell the first or, you know, something like that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to see, the choices that people make in business, you know, I, I'm very open. I've made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Same here. But what I'm proud of is that I've learned from those mistakes and some things you just have to, you got to screw up before you can figure it out. I mean, that's how human beings learn. That's how we work martial arts, right? It doesn't matter how many times the instructor shows you, this is how you do it. You're going to do it wrong a whole bunch of times before you get it anywhere close to right. Oh yeah. I've, I've learned way more from failure than I have from success. Um, and you know, I mean that, that if I'm doing jujitsu and I'm rolling, I learn a lot more from, from tapping to someone than I do from tapping someone. You know, if, if I make a mistake and get arm barred, then that's an opportunity for me to figure out how not to do that again. If I catch somebody in arm bar, it's probably something that I've done hundreds of times before. Um, so yeah, I, I, if you're not. My, my, my kind of personal opinion is if you're not failing, you're not really doing much. Um, and, and it's, it's not an easy way to go about things. And, and you have to have um, a, a certain level of emotional toughness to be able to continue to fail and then push on. But I, I just, I don't know that there's much other way to really grow and, and get better without that. What was the motivation for opening that second location? Um, on some level, uh, probably ego. Um, on some level, you know, maybe monetary. Um, but honestly, when I, when I look back at it now, I, I think probably more ego than monetary, um, which is why I hope that, you know, I, in retrospect, I would learn from that and not repeat that mistake. Yeah, and you know, I, I asked that because I suspected the answer. And the reason I suspected the answer is because that was my path as well. Yeah. Listeners know you you probably do not know that prior to Whistlekick, I had an IT company and you know it was the the world told me I couldn't do it. Yeah. And so 13 months after we opened the first location, I strong armed a second location into half and spent a lot of time driving back and forth and not sleeping and yep. lived at one of the locations for three days because there was such a bad snowstorm I couldn't get home. Yep. So, yep. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> Ego is an interesting thing, isn't it? It really is. Um, you know, it, it, it can be, um, I, I mean, I, on some level, you know, I, you have to have some of that. Um, if, if you're gonna get outside of your box and if you're gonna, grow and succeed i think you have to have some level of ego some something that that pushes you to go beyond what what you are doing now and what other people think you can do um but it's pretty easy i think for it to get out of hand you know for you to lose sight of of certain things because of it so yeah i, I yeah i agree wholeheartedly wholeheartedly i, th I think I think it's, it's such a common occurrence for martial artists, for, for, people, for anybody who engages in something that they develop some skill at, some recognized skill, that we develop ego. 
especially when, you know, maybe you didn't have a lot of confidence in, in who you were, which, you know, that, that's my story. That's a lot of young martial artist stories, right? You know, we start off, we're, we're young and, hey, I'm kind of good at this. And people start recognizing us. But then we have this, this strong divergence between people being tempered and the ego, you know, settling down a bit and others who don't. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I think I'm sure a lot. I, I think what what you said there, you know, I mean, that's what drives a lot of people to martial arts. Um, and then, you know, at some point, uh, and I think with with social media now, you know, maybe that that is a whole other animal, you know, that, that re- drives and feeds ego, and it, it it's it's a dangerous thing, man. It's uh. I, I saw and, and, and shared and exchanged a post the other day where a, a, a student of another self-defense instructor, they basically were, were saying that, you know, the numbers of followers, the numbers of views and numbers of shares, um, it's a direct correlation to, you know, value as an instructor. And that's a dangerous thing. You know, um, in, in our lives, in our history, um, the, the people with the biggest followings aren't always the greatest people. You know, well, uh, no, I think if anything, the correlation is in the other direction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and so, I think it, it in the social media space, it's easy to lose sight of the ground sometimes. You know, and I and I've caught myself on times as well. I mean, we we put out a lot of video content, you know, and I, and I've caught myself on occasion, like, God, why, why is that? Why does that video not have X amount of views or why is that video getting so many thumbs down or whatever, you know? And, um, I, I have to check myself, you know, cause I'm like, cause at the end of the day, who cares? None of that really matters. Um, it, it, everybody's opinion is, is, is equal in those spaces. And most of the time, they're probably people that that have no real experience in what we're talking about. Um, but it, it, it's easy to get inflated. You know, it's easy to to lose sight of that. If you want to see how critical people can get on the internet, I suggest you put a, any content on YouTube oh, it's related to Bruce Lee. <laughs> we have a few vid- few videos up. And in fact, none of them are videos. They're podcast episodes related to episodes mentioning Bruce Lee. And I won't even get into which ones. Yeah. But one of them I've had to add a disclaimer. And I remove about 50% of the comments because they're just offensive. Yeah. And then I watched this conversation on another one that just... It was very clear that people were there with an agenda. Right. Now, if, if this, this is the thing about social media that baffles me. In the real world, if I hear that somebody is on a street corner, you know, three blocks away. Yelling about Bruce Lee. <laughs> yelling about anything that, is, that I believe to be false. Right. I am never going to get in the car yeah. or walk over there and stand across the street and yell, you are wrong, you're an idiot, et cetera, or try to prove them wrong. I'm just going to say, man, that person's dumb. But exactly. something about the convenience of being able to do that from a phone or a computer has created wow. this massive culture of people trying to, I don't know. I think it, point. Yeah, I think it's the convenience. I think it's the anonymity, especially on YouTube. You know, YouTube is a whole other layer of kind of anonymity. If, 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 you have, if you wake up on any given day and you find you have too much faith in humanity, if you think oh. people are really good and kind and loving, go on YouTube and you'll, you'll just, you'll, you'll level up. It's awful. <laughs> it's <laughs> like when, um, when I first started doing videos for Bunker Tactical and Aperture uh, Fight Focus, I had to tell my, my wife and my son, my son's 15, I was like, look, you, you, you can't read the comments. You just can't do it. It's going to be nothing but vitriol, you know, 
uh, with, with a, a, a small smattering from here and there of maybe some s- slightly positive things. But the people that are going to be the most negative are the ones that go out of their way to say the most. <laughs> so, um, yeah, YouTube is awful. Like, I don't, I put out a lot of video content, but I don't read the comments on YouTube. Um, every now and then I'll have somebody sit, send me something that, you know, they think I should interact with. But that's the only way that I ever deal with YouTube comments. It's just not, it, it, it's not worth the emotional investment to me. There's just so much displaced anger out there, you know? <laughs> it is. And I think that, that we could probably take a hard left here if, if we wanted it. And I don't want to because it's a show topic unto itself. But to draw the correlation between that anger and the changing landscape for self-defense. Yeah. You've been in martial arts long enough. Many of our listeners have been in martial arts long enough to know that what you have to consider when teaching self-defense now is different than it was 20, 30 years ago. And I don't just mean that more people are carrying guns or more people are carrying knives. I just mean the psychology. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if as an instructor who, who purports to teach real self-defense and, I, and I'm making a se- separation, if, if you're teaching, you know, um, I don't even want to want, want to throw out a name, but if, if you're teaching something for the art of it, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not talking to you, but if you're out talking about, you know, you're teaching, self-defense based on modern realities, then you cannot be teaching the same way that you were 20 years ago. You just can't. You, you have to be talking about use of force legalities. You have to be talking about um, pre-contact indicators. You have to be talking about um, body language and gesturing and, and, and situational awareness to the point where, um, it's not just about, you know, well, don't, 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 don't turn down dark corners, you know, <laughs> uh, that, that's not situational awareness. That, that that's just common sense. Um, Self-defense doesn't come on a business card. It right. needs to be a little more thorough. Exactly. And, and again, that goes back to, you know, what we talked about earlier. It's, it's a lot easier for me to just go up in front of a group of people and say, well, all you have to do is, I do A, he does B, I do C, he does D. That's really easy to teach that way, but it's intellectually dishonest. Um, so as, a, as, a, as an instructor who is teaching self-defense, you know, if you're telling the 35-year-old accountant how to get from her office to her parking deck to her house safely, um, you, you have to be recognizing and understanding the realities of, of where we are today. And it can't just be about uh, technical solutions. If you could train with somebody that you haven't, anybody, anywhere in the world, any style, and let's even open it up to anywhere in time, who would you want to train with? Hmm. That's an interesting one. Um... I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know on the coaching side of it, but there are a couple of uh, just athletes that I, I think I would like to, to train with just to kind of be in their presence, to see how they train, how they do things, how, or did things or whatever. Um, and most of that's in the boxing world, you know, uh, Lomachenko, for example, um, a, a, a Pacquiao, um, and, and this will sound nuts because I, I don't think he would be, you know, somebody that maybe you would want to spend a lot of time around. But I, I would like when I watch Mike Tyson, early Mike Tyson doing pad work, it's it's crazy scary. It, it, um, he was a frightening man. Incredibly frightening. And I remember watching videos of Kevin Rooney holding pads for him and thinking, you know, that man's taking his life in his hands, holding mitts for him. <laughs> but, but to be in that environment and, and you know, to, to kind of take all that in and, and, and see how a custom auto or a Kevin Rooney or a Teddy Atlas took an, a, a 17, 18 year old kid and turned him into a 20 year old world heavyweight champion, you know, 
that, that that's something that I think I would want to be a fly on the wall for. Um, would I want to train with Mike Tyson? No. Um, would I want to train with his trainers? Yeah, maybe. Um, you know, I, outside of that, I mean, there, there are guys like, um, Olympic wrestlers like a Jordan Burroughs or somebody like that. Um, you know, it, I think an interesting guy that is probably overlooked a lot that I maybe Samuel Hung. Mm. We say a lot of good things on this show about Samuel Hung. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, um, I mean, I know you're probably supposed to say Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris and whatever, and I, I'm not discounting those guys. Um, but it's like, Last weekend, I taught um, at an event called Rev Gear University, and uh, Dan and Asanto was there teaching, and Francis Fong, and Ajarn, Ajarn Chai, and Eric Paulson, and a lot, a lot of guys from the Inasanto camp. And so I took, uh, when I wasn't teaching, I, I took workshops from these guys and I'd, I'd worked with Eric Paulson several times before and he's he's an incredible martial artist incredible fighter but I'd never worked with Anna Santo and so I wanted to I wanted to experience that and it's clear the man has m probably more knowledge about the the history of of 20 different systems and styles and disciplines than anybody on the planet um and and I was probably in the minority here, but I wanted to hear stories about Dan and Asanto. I, I I didn't want to hear stories about Bruce Lee. Um, Dan and Asanto to me is a guy that's got four times the experience that Bruce Lee ever had, um, and in his eighties continues to to train in new and different systems. I I saw earlier this year where he got certified as a bolt wrestling instructor through um, Kenny Johnson. Uh, the guy's in his eighties. He's amazing. Um, and, and so I would, yeah, I wanted to train with 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 Inosanto, and this is going to get me in trouble with, on the Bruce Lee front. But I wanted to hear Inosanto stories. Bruce Lee has been dead for a long time. Those stories have been told over and over again, and they're not changing. <laughs> you know, right. I, I wanted to hear about Inosanto, and I wanted to hear about his journey, and I wanted to hear about his training and things like that. Um, so it, it's funny you ask that because last weekend I got the opportunity to, to train with one of the guys that was on my short list, you know? Um, so I, I don't know. I, it's okay. You don't, you don't have to come up with a hard and fast answer because I don't have a time machine. I don't have a golden ticket. I can't, you know, <laughs> just, just plunk this down and say your wish is granted. Well, uh, so a little bit time. less pressure. If you come up with that time machine, I'll come up with that name. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and it, and it, it is true. You know, Bruce Lee occupies this really interesting space, and, and we talked about him before. We're talking about him again, the most influential martial artist, and he's been dead longer than I've been alive. Yeah. Right. I mean, just utterly fascinating. We've had people on the show who have trained with Bruce Lee. We've had people on the show who trained in Oakland at his school. And they were all nervous coming in. Is this going to be another? Is this going to be a repetition of me talking about Bruce Lee? And I had to assure them in every case, no. If you want to go there, you can go there. But I'm having you on because of you. Yeah. And I think that that's really important. You know, we end up in some of these lineage conversations that maybe there's some, some value when you consider credibility or quality a good instructor is more likely to pass on good knowledge to a good student right so there is some value in there but just because someone trained with bruce lee or read his books everyone has read his books everyone right. has trained with someone who trained with someone who trained with someone right. who trained with bruce lee right you know we're 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 only a few degrees of separation from from that so it really doesn't matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. And that, that, you know, and that's gotten me in a little bit of trouble in, in the past. Um, and, and again, I, I think a lot of times people, um, they don't hear what's said. They, they in, inject what they feel, you know? Yeah. 
or, or they don't read what's written, they inject what they feel, you know, I, I think it's really easy to, to get caught up in that. And anytime I've said anything about lineage or about Bruce Lee or whatever, it wasn't about the lineage or it wasn't about Lee. It was about, for the most part, the, the, the people that, you know, put those things and, and, and those people on, on pedestals and, and can't think outside of, you know, what he said or taught or whatever, you know, I, I think, and, and obviously I don't know, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a student of JKD or anything like that, but um, I have read the books. I have, you know, watched the interview. <laughs> I have I have trained with with you know people in that lineage or whatever and and I I just I, I can't imagine that that he would be on board with a lot of the the ways that you know the the, the people down the line have conducted themselves over the years. Well, we see that all over the place in martial arts. If you go back to you know the early karate, yeah, books, you know the 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 instructors there. You know, they, they spoke quite clearly against a good deal of what was, has been done in their name. Yeah. Let's talk, let's talk more about you again, though, as we start to wind down. What's keeping you going? What is your motivation for waking up every day, for tackling this lifestyle that, frankly, is not an easy one? You talked about the eight to five. I mean, that, that says how much dedication you have. Because most people would call it a nine to five. You talked about it as an eight to five several times. So right. what is it about what you're doing that has you still fired up after decades? Yeah. Um, well, uh, a perfect example is uh, last week, my team and I were in um, two charter schools and one private school teaching staff members how to deal with um, an intruder in the building and how to administer trauma care and things like that to me are super rewarding, you know, um, to, to hope that they never have to use any of it, but to feel like they at least have some options if they do where before they didn't really have any, um, that's the kind of stuff that gets me up in the morning and gets me going. Um, I'll teach, you know, I, I I teach every day in my centers um, and I still travel and, and, and teach seminars and instructor courses all over the world. Um, but every day I, I, I'm teaching classes in my center. I taught last night, I taught three classes. One of them was a kid's class. You know, I had, I don't know, 12, 15 kids in my class. Um, and when I, I, I have a parent come to me and say, you know, that, um, uh, Travion is, is, you know, doing better in school and paying attention. And, you know, he, he's, he, he's got more confidence now. He's not being bullied, blah, blah, whatever. Th those are the kind of the things that make it all worthwhile. You know, it, it's definitely not, I, I know that there are ways to do it. And I know that people have done it very successfully, but I don't think martial arts is the way to get rich. You know. <laughs> um, so if, if somebody's out there looking for it in that, in that way, and again, I know people that have done it. I, I, I know it can be done. Um, but to me, that, that, that's not what motivates me or gets me up in the, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I need to make money. I, I, I need to, you know, keep centers going and I need to pay my mortgage and, you know, all, all those things and pay staff and buy new equipment and all that, all that. But that's not what drives me. What drives me is, you know, uh, Travion. What drives me is is the woman that came in and uh, had super low self esteem and and lost thirty pounds, you know, uh, or the teachers that now feel more confident about their abilities to keep their kids safe in their schools, and you know, th those are the kinds of things. And and at the end of the day, I I, I love teaching, you know, I. I love standing in front of a group of people and, and seeing light bulbs go off. And I love watching somebody that's never thought about throwing a punch before in their lives, hitting focus mitts. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I love what I do. Um, do I want to have centers for another 10 or 12, 20 years? Probably not. Um, but do I want to keep teaching? Absolutely. 
And if people want to learn more about you, they want to find you online, social media, websites, any of that, where can we send them? Um, fitthefight.com or ryanhooverftf.com. And then there's a good bit of uh, video content um, at aperturefightfocus.com. Cool. And of course, we'll link that stuff over at the show notes. If you happen to be new, that's at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Well, I appreciate your time here. This has been great. Lots of fun. We had some good conversations, some stuff that honestly I didn't know we were going to get into. And I always love when that happens. So I appreciate yeah, it. I enjoyed it. And I really appreciate the invitation. Cool, cool. Well, one more thing. We always ask our guests for, for that last little bit, right? Oh, there's always more. There's always a little bit more. And this is a little bit more. All right. What parting words, what wisdom would you offer up to the folks listening today? Um, a, a, a big mantra of ours here is everyone's fighting something. And so um, whether that's, you know, getting through traffic every day or whether that's standing in line at DMV or that's dealing with relationship issues or, you know, health issues or whatever. I, I don't care who you meet in your day, everyone is fighting something. And so I think it's important to, to, to know a, that you're not alone and B that, you know, maybe that guy or girl that cut you off or flipped you off or cursed at you or whatever, you know, you don't know what happened to them in that day. So, Maybe just blow that thing off and, and, and move on and uh, make the most out of your day. All you can really, at the end of the day, the only variable you really control is you. Um, so maybe just let that pass. What a fun conversation. Really had a good time with Mr. Hoover today. And actually, he referenced coming back from a training event recently. And you know what? I know some folks who were at that event. And they said wonderful, wonderful things about him. Hopefully, I'll get to train with him soon, too. Mr. Hoover, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for your time. If you want to check out the show notes, be sure to head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find photos and links and, of course, 325 other episodes. Unless you're listening to this in the future, in which case, we will have more, every one of them available for free. If you want to find out about all the other stuff we do, head to whistlekick.com. And of course, you can find us on social media. We are at Whistlekick pretty much everywhere you can imagine. Thanks for listening today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.